Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Laurie Smith. Welcome to my show. Sorry about that. I'm about 10 minutes late. I uh, had problems with Skype and couldn't get in and uh, had to reboot and everything, so it's taken me forever to get back in here. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's good to be here. This is One Child to Be a Survivor to Another. Tuesday morning, January the, the uh, 18th, and I'm uh, happy to be here. I want to continue looking at mentalhealth.net. There's another couple of articles on there that I think are really worth bringing out. So sorry, I'm sure that uh, most people will figure that the show is not happening, so they probably won't listen. Um, and, you know, hopefully if, if somebody catches this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk for the 30 minutes and go a little bit over time on the show. You won't be able to hear it because it won't be streaming, but um, it'll be on the actual archive. So if anybody wants to check it out, they can. Thanks a lot for tuning in. I appreciate it. Um, Skype, I don't know. I've been having problems for a few days with Skype, and um, I don't know the, my connection between Blog Talk Radio and Skype, so I don't know what's going on, but it's unfortunate. Um, there's not much I can do about it once it happens, and so none of us uh, on Blog Talk Radio have that have that capability unless you use your phone, which the long distance charges would be absolutely crazy. So that's why I do this through Skype, right? Um, this particular article is called "After the Abuse Has Ended," and uh, this is from MentalHelp.net, www.mentalhelp.net, and it's from Catherine Patricelli. She's written a whole number of articles on here do, dealing with abuse, uh, child abuse, domestic violence, and whatnot. Very interesting stuff, and I hope that everybody will check it out. Um, we finished up talking about why do adults stay in abusive relationships yesterday. And so I want to look at after the abuse has ended. And um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So yeah, I'm not a counselor or a therapist. I don't hold any certificates in those areas. You have to listen at your own discretion. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own blog talk shows, and I say this on every show. I want people to know that, you know... Uh, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a therapist, and I'm just a survivor, really, who's working through my healing journey, as well as the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. I've been studying and working on uh, human rights, child rights especially, and uh, the prevention of child abuse for about four years now. And I'm the, I got involved with Dreamcatchers for Abused Children, and um, it's it's just awesome. Yet, So, you know, I'm just... You know, I'm not a professional. You have to listen at your own discretion. And I talk about everything to do with abuse and a very sensitive subject. So, you know, if you feel like the, show, the topic of abuse might bother you or make you uncomfortable, you have to turn it off because it is ultimately your choice and your discretion uh, to listen to, the, to any show like this, including mine. And young people under the age of 18, I ask that you have permission to listen to my show because uh, I believe in protecting children at all times. And so you need to have permission to listen to my show. There's a lot of adult content on my shows, that's why. And I just feel like children should be should know how to keep themselves safe online and should let an adult know what you're doing online. And so have an adult listen to the show with you who's older, who can help you make the decision uh, whether you should be listening or not, right? Thanks very much. So we'll get right into this article. Chat room is open if anybody would like to sit in there. And this is after the abuse has ended uh, from mentalhelp.net. And I'm going to pop the link into the chat room and just in case anybody happens to pop in there, they can, you can actually check this article out as well and uh, for yourself. Right? There's some good info on this website. And so Catherine Patricelli wrote this in December um, of 2005, and she says, getting out of the abusive situation is the first step toward healing and moving on in your life, but unfortunately, your work doesn't end there, she says. Uh, once you are physically safe and secure, it is a good idea that you seek professional help for any abuse-related difficulties you may develop. For example, she says, you may have difficulty coping with abuse memories themselves. Um, you may also benefit from assistance in coping with problems that develop because you were abused, such as substance abuse problems, sexual or intimacy issues, anger issues, eating disorders, etc., and such problems may occur during your abuse period as a means of coping with the abuse itself or after the abuse period as a means of coping with the abuse itself, right? Uh, or or as or after the abuse period is over, as a means of coping with the abuse memories. So there's reasons why people do things, and that's the whole issue. Like people, you know, who have been abused, uh, some of our behaviors, maybe not all of them, but some of them would could be a direct result of the abuse. And I know for myself, you know, looking back on my life, and especially my teenage years, I was really heavy into drugs. <clears throat> And I wasn't, you know, like a weekend, uh, you know, drug user. I was like, I was looking to be high all the time. And um, so every chance that I got, really, from the age of 12 up until the, about the age of 21, I was using drugs of some type. I wasn't stealing for my drugs. I used to work, uh, you know, for, I used to work like two or three jobs sometimes to support my habits as well as just trying to make ends meet. 
And um, so I was always working, never stealing for my drugs. But the thing is, is that all my money went on drugs when I, until about the age of 21 and um, just partying. And, and, you know, that was my lifestyle. That's the lifestyle I chose for myself. And I always swore I would never do drugs. But at the age of 12, I decided that I needed to do drugs because it was about the only way I could figure that I could cope in the abusive environment that I was living in. And my brothers were all doing drugs. Well, not all of them, but uh, two of my brothers were doing drugs. None of my sisters were doing drugs. Well, one of my sisters was using marijuana, smoking pot, but, you know, that was no big deal because she was not really hooked on it, and she only, it was kind of more of a, you know, they say recreational use type thing. (laughs) My sister was not really uh, into the drug scene, and she was, she mostly liked to have a beer with her friends and stuff. She was not a big-time user. Like myself, was just continually looking to be high, and didn't matter what the actual drug was. The only thing I refused to do it when I was young and, and, and all the way through was to shoot up. Uh, I never wanted to do that, and I made a sort of a deal with myself that I would never allow myself to do that, so I never did that. And so, But I was very much into um, anything else I could find, you know, whether it was hallucinogenics or, um, you know, methamphetamines, whatever I could find, speed, um, you know, cocaine, lots and lots of marijuana and just whatever I could get my hands on. So, you know, I had issues with that, but when I was 21, I decided to quit and that's because my brother killed himself and he was a big time cocaine addict. And, you know, he had so many problems just from the, you know, he grew up in the same home I did. Right. And, um, I kind of saw myself going the the way he was going and I thought, Oh my God, I'm going to end up in, in, I'm going to end up dead from a drug overdose or I'm going to end up, you know, killing myself or, or whatever, I, I got to stop doing the drugs. So I got off of that myself, by myself. It took me a, a couple of years of really some hard work to do it, but I did it by myself. And there's many th- things that people will do. I, you know, my big thing now is I still smoke cigarettes, and I'm, you know, I know that the reason why I'm smoking cigarettes. I know I look back on it and I think of why I'm actually doing it, and I don't think it's even so much just the addiction because it's, it's almost just like something I'm looking for, something I think that I need, something that is missing in my life, so I, I replace it with cigarettes. And I'm sure that's what it is, you know what I mean? It's not just the addiction itself. It's not just the, the nicotine or the, the drug itself inside the cigarettes. It's more of a something that I'm still searching for because of the abuse that I suffered. And I look back on it, and I think absolutely it is. It's probably the way the only the way that I feel I can cope with uh, with not having that nurturing, not having that loving environment to grow up in where I felt safe and secure. I was always uh, uptight as a child, very much nervous, um, you know, uncomfortable with myself, with my with my life, uncomfortable all the time because I was made to be uncomfortable as a child, right? But uncomfortable even in my own skin as an adult, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm still sort of searching. That's why I'm, I'm still on my healing journey. Um, at some point, would like to let go of the cigarettes because I know that I'm just using them because I missed out on something as a child, which is probably just being nurtured that's i think that's why i smoke it's that whole you know calming thing it's like okay as long as i can have a cigarette i'm okay as long as i can have a cigarette you know things are good right and it's it's just a crutch it's i'm just using it in place of of actually being able to get in touch with something that i need to get in touch with from my childhood and it probably goes way way back to my infant infant stages i wouldn't doubt it probably because my mom by the time i came around my mom was a my mom was actually in a coma when i was when I was born, because they had to take me in the C-section, because I was killing, I was dying, my blood was killing her blood. We both had that Rh factor uh, disease going on, that blood disease, and the Rh factor. And so um, the doctors had to take me because um, I was either going to die, my mom was going to die, or both of us were going to die. So they they did an emergency C-section and got me out, and my, I was in an incubator for a while. My mom was in a coma off and on for a bit, and you know, when she came to, she was not all the happiest camper because it's really, she, I, I was born out of marital rape, so she did not want me, and I here, here she had another squalling baby at the age of 38 years old, here she is 38 years old, hating my dad, you know, for what he was doing to her and to the children, and, uh, so I was not brought up in a good, healthy, loving environment, right? I'm, I'm, I look back at the first few years of my life, and I think I have some real cognitive memories of the first few, first few years of my life, really starting about the age of two, moving forward. And it was just such a horrible experience. You know, there was no, 
you know, cuddling and sitting on the couch with mom, you know, and reading books and having her, you know, really look after me or care for me. So I missed out on a lot of nurturing, and I think that's why I smoke. As far as eating disorders go, I just like to eat too much, so I don't really have any kind of like binging thing going on like that. If I just 